Good afternoon, CS109. How are you guys doing today? Oh, okay, I appreciate that. I know that there, for many people, there is still a midterm tonight. Um, hey, I just want to say thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. In fact, actually, there's bets going on in the TAs about like how many people would actually be able to come today. And we thought, like, do we cancel the lecture? We're like, no, this is the best lecture. We can't cancel it. Um, and we were all underestimated. Uh, there is a small note. I did want to say there's no word of the day for, for today. Everyone's going to get credit. Um, but this is one of the more core lectures. So if you're watching it, you are doing such a good favor to your future self. So it's one of my favorite lectures in CS109. And if you're watching this online, definitely something you're going to want to know and certainly need to know for your problem set coming up. Um, we are going to be doing the most beautiful meta thing. We're going to be thinking about the random variable of probabilities and there probably couldn't be a more CS109 topic. It's so deep and it's so profound and it solves real life problems. You probably have this intuition. I present you with two YouTube videos and forget about the content though. If you're not into Davey 504 yet, you should check it out. He's a slap and bass player. Uh, and if you saw these two YouTube videos and you're just thinking about um, the probability that you'll like the movie and you just looked at the number of likes, this one has 10,000 likes and 50 dislikes. This one has 10 likes and zero dislikes. If you were sorting by, you know, a probability of a like, you might decide that this has a one probability of like and this doesn't. And you might get kind of the erroneous result that this might be the movie that you're more likely to like. Does that make sense? Intuitively, do you guys get the idea that this is probably a better choice if you had to just choose one based off of likes? But wouldn't it be nice to put some real fundamental mathematics behind that? We're gonna do that today and we're gonna learn the most cool thing. It's such good practice for you. It's going to solve problems like this and it's also going to be a foundation upon which we're going to build all these beautiful randomized algorithms. So I presented one problem for you guys. How do you choose your YouTube video? But there's lots of problems that I could tell you that we don't have a good fundamental perspective on which we're going to get today. And here's another issue that I could talk about. Here are two different people who give you a probability of 0.8 for whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. One person just says, uh, I don't know, my leg itches when it rains, so I'm gonna say there's an 80% chance it rains tomorrow. And somebody's like, I've done some hardcore calculations, I've seen a whole bunch of information in the past, and based on that, I have a probability of 0.8 tomorrow. Until now in CS109, both of these are treated the same. They're both treated as probability of 0.8. But okay, who wants to go with problem person A? Who thinks that like they're the more reasonable person to trust and who thinks person B? Yeah, person B. We don't have a language for how confident somebody should be. And that's not so bad if you're choosing between 0.8 and 0.8, but it does become a problem if you have to get more information and update a belief. Like now if we gather something like the weather of the day before, then maybe when we have to incorporate our new information, we have to think about confidence in a more interesting way. Okay, so I'm presenting some things that we should be able to do, but we can't do. And then I'm going to leave you with this philosophy. This is one of the deep philosophies of CS109. Those who are able to represent what they do not know make better decisions. If you think about it, you know, we take all these concepts that you might have thought of as single numbers and we turn them into whole belief distributions. We've been doing that for a while in CS109 and we're going to take that to the next level today. And today we're going to think about representing what we do not know about probabilities themselves. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit unintuitive, but the math is deeply beautiful and it is incredibly useful. Also did want to note that problem set four is out. It's got a whole bunch of cool things like you're going to be working with real Bayesian networks. Um, you are going to be expressing uncertainty as to somebody's ability. Uh, I think this one was for chess. Uh, you're going to be looking at biometric keystrokes. There's a whole bunch of really wonderful, interesting problems. And one of the interesting ones we're going to play today, so I won't get too much into it now, but you're going to be thinking about learning while helping. If you have to make a choice between A and B, and you have to dynamically make that choice while that choice is also affecting people, how do you do that in a good way? In the problem set, the first chunk of it has to do with probabilistic models, and the last chunk of it is from today's lecture. So learn today's lecture, and then you'll finish off with the knowledge you'll need for problem set four. Not too much review we're gonna build off of, but if there's one concept we're really gonna build off of, it's this idea of inference. You have a prior belief, you get an observation, and then you update your belief. And the reason that this is so interesting is, this was modeling somebody's ability to see. Before 109 came to this test, 
people would think about ability to see as a single number, and then we turned it into a whole random variable with a whole probability distribution. Instead of thinking ability to see as a single number, we say, okay, there's some possibility this person really can't see, and some possibility they really can see, and I'm going to have a belief for every possible assignment to how well they can see. And that's how I represent ability to see. Not just one number, a whole random variable. Questions about that before I jump in? Two things? Okay, that's what we're building off of. Um, oh, and just, you know, when we got into this problem, uh, don't forget that we really solved this problem by having Bayes' theorem. You took your random variable, and then when you got more information, you could use a function of how likely you were to see your observations given the true state of somebody's ability to see. You could use Bayes' theorem and you could update your random variable's belief. So not only is it more expressive to use a whole random variable, but we also have this wonderful language for how to incorporate information to update our beliefs. Okay, and then um, in plain English, the things you needed for Bayes' theorem was a prior belief. You needed a likelihood function. How likely is an observation given a state of a random variable? Uh, and then one of the things we've talked a lot about is ways you can deal with this denominator. We call this the normalization constant. And we've talked about how actually, because this denominator is not changing as values of little a changes, one way to think about this is this is a constant. And if you solve this numerator for all the different values of little a, like I calculate this for little a equals zero, I calculate this numerator for little a equals 0 0.1. If you calculate all those values for all the little a's, if you sum them up, that's what this is. So you can calculate all your values of the numerator and then just normalize. And that's a quick way to do Bayes' theorem over a whole random variable. End of review. Shall we jump into the mystery that is today? And I do want to let you know where we are. We are getting so close. We're on this last the penultimate section of class where we're learning about uncertainty theory. We're going to start diving deeper into the underpinning mathematics of probability theory. Okay, and it starts with flipping a plate. <laughs> I'm going to be taking this plate here. I'm going to start flipping this plate. In fact, I'm going to play a game. I'm going to ask for a volunteer to come join it. And while somebody's thinking about whether or not they want to play, I'm going to let you know that I want a divisional for the slide. So I asked uh, AI agent Dolly to come up with a Rembrandt version of me flipping a, a plate in class. <laughs> so AI drew that painting. Anyone want to come play this game? Yeah, come on up. You raise your hand first. Yeah, yeah, so you get to come. Um, and this game is very simple. You're going to flip a plate three times. And if you get heads three times, uh, you win. And then we'll discuss what your prize is. So you've only got like a 30% chance of winning, but you know, like you cost, yeah, cost you nothing to play. This, this is heads. This is tails. Okay. Does that count? It's yeah. a plate. It doesn't have heads and tails. What are we talking about? Question but, real quick. Yes. Did you type Chris Beach into Dolly? No, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we got one tails and zero heads. Okay, whoa, 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 slow down. Tails and heads. One tails, okay, we got four more flips to go. Two tails. Okay, we need three heads row, do it, you can do it. Yes, okay, two more heads. Whoa, it comes down to the final flip. Okay, a round of applause, we got this, you can do it. Yay! <laughs> okay, now we have to discuss the prize. Well, come, come talk to me after class and we'll figure out what that is. <laughs> All right, a round of applause, thank you very much. Wonderful, in class we know how to think about, you know, this binomial distribution. Every time you flip a coin or you, you run an experiment, it's independent. And we think it's got equal probability of being heads. Uh, now, there's just this one assumption that really I want to pro make problematic, which is if you have a coin, there's an argument for why heads and tails should be equal. It's symmetric. You know, there's no reason heads should be more likely than another. But with my plate, it's not symmetric. So you lose your ability to say there's a 50% chance of heads and a 50% chance of tails. Um, and, and really, I want to leave you with this question. What is the probability of heads on this plate? Because all of our analysis is based off of us knowing it's one half, but we don't know it's one half, and how could we think about that? Now, plates are not that interesting. You know what is interesting? Drugs. People coming up with drugs want to decide. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Somebody's going to cut that clip uh, and it's going to come across wrong. <laughs> 
uh, I meant medical drugs. Uh, and so if you give a, a medical drug to somebody, you want to know the probability that it solves their problem. And that's not going to be 50-50. But knowing that's going to be really important, and you're often going to be estimating it really quickly when you have not that much data. You might have tried it on six people, and you need to really quickly figure out what is its probability. So it leads to this final question that I want to plant to your mind. What's your belief that a coin flip gives you heads? And on some level, that's asking the question is, think about P, and I want to start thinking about it as a random variable. So the number of heads, that was a binomial. But that P for the binomial, that's the probability of getting heads on the coin flip. I want to do the wildest thing. And we're gonna take this wild leap and it's gonna take us on such an adventure. And the wild leap I've written on the board. And I'm actually gonna try and do some board work today. I'm going to allow the probability of heads to be a random variable itself. Let me show you, you know, random variables, we think of them as being represented by a probably mass function or probably density function. If x is a random variable, it means it can take on any value between zero and one. Agreed? Why not more than one? Because it's representing a probability. I want to think about x as a random variable, so I might get a probability mass function like that. And if I had a probability, or probably density function rather, like that, it would be saying that I think the probability is somewhere between like 50% and 60%, or maybe like 30% and 60%. So we're gonna try and come up with a way of thinking about x as a random variable, which means we're gonna really want to try and come up with a probability density function for x. Now, I'm going to give you a particular context to think about. And the particular context to think about is I've flipped this plate 10 times. And I flipped this plate 10 times and I got nine heads. And if I got nine heads, this would be a pretty reasonable estimate for the probability, wouldn't it be? But that single number is not a random variable, it's just a number. And it's missing the expressivity of saying, I got this number from only 10 flips. You know that 90% would have been the same number you had gotten if you had 100,000 flips and you know, uh, 90,000 of those came up as heads and they should have different confidences. So I'm gonna break all of the logic we've had so far and I'm gonna let x be a random variable. We're no longer having probability being a number, it's going to be a random variable. Why don't I use capital P for the random variable for probability? Wouldn't that be so awful? It'd be like P of P equals X. Oh my God, my notation would be awful. So I want to have a random variable for probability. I'm going to use X because I can't use capital P in probability land. Okay. If I make X a random variable, I have a different way of thinking about probability if I've seen nine heads and one tails. I can write this beautiful equation, which you've never seen before, but it's a really cool one. It's saying, what's my belief in probability, given I've seen nine heads and one tail. And a lot of you guys are getting primed to see this. And anytime you say conditional, your mind goes Bayes. <laughs> Do you guys wanna see what happens if we just threw Bayes at this wonderful question? If we threw Bayes at this wonderful question, you get the probability of this given that as your first term. So probably heads equals nine and tails equals one. Oh, I missed a given given x equals x times the probability that x equals x divided by some constant. <laughs> and by some constant, I mean like, okay, this should actually be the probability of heads equals nine and tails equals one kind of marginalized over all the values of x. So integrate from zero to one, the probability of heads equals nine, tails equals one, given x equals x, times the probability that x equals x. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that sounds so awful. But recall, I'm, even though that's the real expression, I know that it's a constant. As you change the numerator, this value doesn't change. It doesn't solve all of our problems. And before I do anything, um, I just wanna leave you guys with this. I don't want you to talk to your partner and trying to come up with an answer, but I want you to talk to your partner and try and come up with a good question to ask them. 
Make sure, this is a weird statement. What is that saying? If it helps, try putting in a 0.5 in for little x and saying, what's the probability that x takes on the value 0.5? See if you can come up with a good question. See if you can think about these three terms and have a good conversation for just a minute and then we're gonna dive into and we're going to solve this equation on the board. Okay, talk to the person next to you, have a nice little chat and let's get into this. Okay. I have put a small mistake on this board. But first I want to take some questions. Maybe some of the questions will lead me to have to think about that small mistake. Is this weird or what? X is a random variable. Can I ask you guys some questions? What's the probability that X is less than zero? Yeah, yeah, your random variable that represents probably can't be less than zero. What's the probability that X is greater than one? Yeah, can't be greater than one. Okay, that sounds very good. Um, is X discrete or is it continuous? It is continuous. Yeah, we think about probabilities as being able to take on continuous values. In which case, there is a small notation mistake I've made. This shouldn't be a probability. Instead, it should be a density. You know, for continuous random variables, we want this other idea, which is a density. And over here, too, our prior belief also needs to be a density. This is not a density. What does this statement say? It says, I am entering the world where the true probability of a heads is equal to little x. Put in 0.5 for x. And it says, I'm entering the world where the true probability of a heads is 0.5. In that world, what's the probability of getting nine heads in one tail? That's not a probability density. That is a straight probability. OK, questions that came up. OK, you actually have the tools to reason about this term. This prior though, it's, priors are hard to just reason about from first principles. Normally they're given to you. What is a reasonable belief before you see any evidence? So I've just given you a brand new drug. It could work 0% of the time, it could work 100% of the time. You have zero evidence. What's a reasonable prior belief for how well this drug works? Yeah? Yeah, uniform, but are there other choices? So your prior belief is uniform. It's just as likely to be between zero and one. What about this one? You could say, I believe it's one half. And I'm very confident it's one half. I'm really confident it's one half. If you've never seen this drug before, which one do you want? Do you want to say, I'm pretty sure it's one half and I'm going with that? Or do you want to say, I have no information and it's equally likely? Who wants, I'm pretty sure it's one half? And who wants, I have no information? Yeah, that's the prior we want. Before you see anything about your drug, you have to have a prior belief. And the best prior is if you've got no information, all probabilities look equally likely. Now you have enough information for this part and that part. By the way, you see this? Because this is equal to this divided by a constant, do you guys know that I can move this constant over here? I can just have like my one over the constant here. I could just make this like one over the constant. And for those of you guys who are really fancy, you can just write is proportional to. How fancy do I, it's like a little backwards fish. But that just means equals that times a constant. I'm getting a little more fancy than I need to. Okay, I said you guys could reason about this term. Should we put in a value of 0.5? Imagine a value of 0.5 in for little x. It's saying what's the probability of this given that that is the probability of getting heads. If I tell you the probability of heads and I ask you what's the chance of getting nine heads, scream out what you want to do. 
yeah, it's a binomial. You've had 10 trials, you got nine successes, and I've told you the probability of success because we've entered the world where this is the true probability of success. Because I'm conditioning off of this, you now know the probability. This is what a binomial looks like in this notation. And so we can say this is e proportional to the binomial coefficient. So you have 10 trials, we have nine successes. What's the probability of success on each trial? X. Ooh, yeah, it's a little x there. It's not p. X is our random variable that's representing p. How many successes did I get? Nine. How many failures did I get? Ooh, what's the probability of a failure? One minus x, how fancy. And there's been one failure. This is just a binomial. It says 10 experiments, nine successes. The probability of success is x. Now, you're like, but, but x is a variable here. Yeah. And we're going to be thinking about it for all possible values. We'll think about it for 0. We'll think about it for 0 0.25, 0 0.1 half, 0.75. For all values, we'll be thinking about this. OK, how about this one? This term over here seems annoying. It's our prior belief that x takes on the value little x. Again, enter the mindset that little x is 1 half for now. What is the density of 1 half? Well, this is what we said our prior was. If little x is 0, what's this value? 1. If little x is 1 half, what's this value? How about 0.75? I'm not getting that tricky, am I? No matter what you put in for a little x, it will come out as a 1. So this whole term just becomes times 1. And you're left with, by the way, this is a constant. You're left with. The density of x is proportional to x to the power of 9 times 1 minus x to the power of 1. Do you guys want to know what that looks like if you were to graph it? It looks like this. Your belief after you see 9 is still a random variable. It's just a random variable. Oh wait, I got that wrong. It's more confident than that. Like if you were to plot that equation that we just derived it would look something like this. It's going to say, I'm pretty sure that the true probability is close to 0.9, but I have room for doubt. I think it's possible that the true probability is 1 half, and then I just saw a really unlucky set of heads and tails. I think it is very unlikely that true probability is 0, and it's possible that the true probability is greater than 9. By making probability a random variable, I'm able to hold all this doubt in my mind. I'm able to express my belief in all the possible assignments to the probability p. If you followed along this hard set of math, that's the hardest thing for today and the most important thing for today, and you'll understand uh, the whole concept of a beta distribution. So let's take some questions. Yeah? So a question on our assertion of the uniform distribution. Yes. Just repeat again why we know that every value has to be 1. My intuition was like, OK, if we are dividing, if every single probability is equal, that's like an infinitely small number chance that each probability can happen. Okay, so let's go, uh, that's a good question. So I want to pull this one up. The uniform distribution, it takes in a min and a max, and if you put zero and one, the equation for the uniform distribution says that it's, its value at all those is one divided by your max minus your min, and one divided by one minus zero is just one. So if we have the, z the uniform from zero to one, this was our prior belief, and its density is one everywhere. Does that kind of answer the question? And the reason is not like the infinite, this uniform is kind of doing that infinite small division. And then, you know, as you get into derivative space, nicely, this just becomes a box plot. And the height of the box plot is just your max minus your minimum. Or one divided by that. Good question. Cool. More questions, more questions. Yes. If you had gotten like 10 heads and no tails, would that have changed the graph to look more like parabolic? So wouldn't that mean like there was like an upward trend for the probability of this one, for the probability of this one being... Yes, you're right. So hold that question because when I pull up the graphs, we're going to look at a whole bunch of them and ask me again then. But you're right. Your intuition is correct. Yes? Like, it's like still about like new form like random variables. Like usually, like when you find like the integral of like the probability density function is sums up to one, how do you get in this thing? If you integrate under this box, my claim is it integrates to one. 
If you integrate over here, you're going to get the area of this rectangle, right? The width of the area of the rectangle is 1 minus 0. That's 1. And the height of the rectangle is 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. This integral is 1. Good question. Fantastic. OK. That's, so we talked a lot about this. And then you guys seem to be following along on this idea of the binomial very nicely. Yes? I have a question on the equation Yeah. You can see how we got from the second last to the last. From here to here? Yes, please. Um, all that I lost is I lost the minus times 1. And then I also lost this thing. But that's because I thought it was a constant. So this proportional to, it's hiding that it's actually this. But there's a whole bunch of constants I've multiplied everything by. And if I want to be explicit, everything's multiplied by 10 over, choose 9, divided by you know, the denominator of Bayes' theorem. But I'm going to call that k. Uh, and so if you want to make this an equal sign, it would look like this. And the proportional is just capturing the fact that this is a constant. It has nothing to do with little x. OK, such good questions. So. If you flip a coin 10 times, I have just given you something much more sophisticated to do than just saying your probability is 9 over 10. I've allowed you to express your whole probability belief in the coin being heads, the probability of a coin being heads, as a random variable. This is the derivation we did. You know, this we've identified as the binomial, that we've identified as the uniform. If you just plug in the uniform, you get a 1, and you're just left with the binomial. And then my claim is that this is the normalization constant. We've seen very many times. You could calculate it in some ways, or you could just find whichever value allows this thing to integrate to 1. OK, and here is the actual plot of what that looks like. I drew it by hand, but this is the actual plot of x to the power of 9 times 1 minus x to the power of 1 if you were to find the k that makes sure that this integrates to 1. Cool, right? Oh, I love this plot. I find it so interesting. Um, there's a little bit of a philosophy here. There's a whole um, world of probabilities that think you're never allowed to have a prior. Like, there is a prior belief in here. They call themselves frequentists. But a lot of people I know fall into this camp of Bayesian, which is like, if you allow yourself to have this prior, there's such elegant mathematics that can allow you to have a posterior. So I just want to bring that up a little bit. We can talk more about that in office hours if people find it interesting. OK, going to bump this up a little bit. What if we had to solve this, but we didn't have uh, exactly how many heads and tails there were, but instead we just said there was n heads and m tails. So this is the exact same derivation that we did before. But instead of putting in numbers 9 and 1, I'm going to allow them to be little n for number of heads and little m for number of tails. You know why I want to do that? Because you might want to do this for numbers that are not 9 and 1. You might want to see what happened if I had 6 heads and 3 tails. And you like to be able to do the same sort of mathematics. So this is the exact same derivation, but we're going to put in symbols for heads and symbols for number of tails. Make sense? And if you do that exact same derivation, you get the exact same thing. You get some constant times x to the power of number of heads times 1 minus x to the power of number of tails. You look at this equation over here, you see the similarity. It's just we used a number 9 for heads and 1 for tails. And this is n for heads and m for tails. OK. And this is a beautiful expression of a random variable. I note that there's a constant here. And if you wanted to find that constant, you could find whichever number makes this equation integrate to 1, which we've done before on problem sets. Ah, <sighs> And this is it on one slide. If there was a major key, if you've seen n successes and m failures, you can say your new belief in the probability of a success is given by this gorgeous equation where if you ever needed to find that constant, you could. But it turns out oftentimes you don't actually need to find that constant. Oh, And this could have been how they invented math. And this could have been how they defined things. But uh, it turns out that people did things slightly different, which I'll get to in a second. But I just want to make it clear that you know, if you want to do seven heads and one tails, you would just plug in seven for n and one for number of tails. And you would plot it, and you would get some sort of beautiful representation of your uncertainty. 
Is it possible if you've seen seven heads and one tails that the true probability is 0.5? It's not that likely, but it's certainly possible. Is it possible that it's 0.8? Oh yeah, and it's starting to look pretty likely. But you know, the most likely one here is uh, 7 divided by 8. Unfortunately, whoever invented this mathematics did the cheekiest little thing. They did define a random variable for this, but they added a hidden plus 1 just to mess up 109 students, just to make sure that there's always one extra point on a midterm or a final problem. People did define this random variables and they said, I will tell you the belief in your probability if you've seen a certain number of heads and certain number of tails. But just to mess you up, the parameters won't be number of heads and number of tails. No, no, that would be too simple. Instead, we'll make the parameters number of heads plus one and number of tails plus one, just to make sure everyone's always doing their plus ones correctly. And so they defined a random variable that looks exactly like what we derived, but you have to take number of heads plus one and subtract off one. And you have to take number of tails plus one and subtract off one. What cheeky buggers. But they did it and we can't fight it now, it's much too late. The people who did this derived this thing called a beta random variable. It has this probability density function, it's what we derived, but the parameters are number of heads plus one and number of tails plus one, so the probability density function has to subtract off the ones to make it the same derivation of what we got. Here is a bunch of different betas. Here is a beta with one heads and seven tails. Notice how I minus one there, so cheeky. This is a beta if you saw four heads and four tails. This is a beta if you saw seven heads and one tail. A question. One. So, are you, do you know why? Yeah, some of the mathematics that are a little bit beyond, like you get into like different moments, like some of those more complicated things I think work out a little bit nicer. And we will see a couple of them, like expectation and variance. The equation, actually, yeah, let's, let's pull those up. Okay, the expectation equation, a little bit cleaner. The variance equation, a little bit cleaner. And you can imagine as you go deeper into the moments, uh, which we don't do in CS109, it, the mathematics makes it much easier to have the plus one. Okay. So when we use the beta random variable, we should plug in? Not A and B, but A plus one and B plus one. Or number of heads, add one, that becomes A. You take your number of tails, you add one, that becomes B. <laughs> it's like, life is hard enough when you're thinking about probably as a random variable. Who needs this plus one? But I don't know, mathematicians in those days were cruel. Not anymore. Now we're like warm and fuzzy. You're mathematicians too. Okay, so a bunch of betas and beta is the random variable for probabilities and it's a beautiful thing. It has two parameters. You take your number of successes, AKA heads, add one. You take your number of failures, add one, call those A and B, and then you just plug it in. And now I want to go back to this deep philosophical idea. Now you have two ways of representing a probability. This is what we did until today. We would say your probability is 0.75. And from now on, I can give you a probability not as a single point estimate, that's a fancy way of saying a number, but I can give it to you as a whole random variable. And that whole random variable is going to do so much work for us. Not only does it tell you your most likely probability, but it also gives you a sense of how uncertain you are about your probability. It tells you how confident I should be in this 0.75. There is no confidence expressed in this number. And by having the expression of confidence, we're gonna open up the world of randomized algorithms. And we have so many cool things that we'll be able to do. How fun is this? Are you guys following along? This is crazy complicated stuff, but it seems like you guys are following the plot, which I love to hear. Um, it's a distribution of probabilities. I also want to point out, it's one of the few distributions that we have that's bounded in a min to max. Uniform and betas are the two random variables we have that have a clear minimum value and a clear maximum value. Okay, I'm gonna mess things up. If you followed the plot line till now, you've gotten the most heart of the matter. But I do wanna give you the fancy details on top. You guys ready for it? We made a uniform decision for our prior. What if you used a beta itself as a prior? And what that means is somebody comes up to you and they say like, I got this plate. Before you start flipping it, I have a belief. I can look at its physics and I can say, I think it's more likely to be a heads than a tail. I express that to you as a beta. I express that to you as a beta three, two. So number of imagined heads 
was two and imagined tails was one, three, two. That's my prior belief for you. That's gonna mess up our math, isn't it? Because now instead of having a one here, we have to put in a beta probability density function. Boogers. And by beta probability density function, I mean this beautiful equation over here. What happens? So what's the belief in X given N heads? And there's an implicit M tails here as well. So that's the probability of seeing your N heads within your experiments. Given the true probability, this is what we have up there. But now we're gonna have a different prior. We're still gonna have the same binomial over here. It's just this is not going to be just a one. Now your prior is a beta. Wild. Ready for it? Just put in that whole beta probability density function right there. You're like, oh, that's so ugly. Well, let's clean it up a little bit. Why don't we get all the constants here? So that's a constant that, or actually that is not a constant, but um, do, 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 do. that's a constant, that's a constant. Oh, actually, no, sorry, sorry, this is a constant. So I'm gonna take this one, this one, and this one. These are all constants, and I'm just gonna put them into one. Doesn't that look cleaner already? By constants, I mean these values don't change uh, as you change x. So if you change x, this stays the same. If you change x, this stays the same. If you change x, this stays the same. So we're gonna put it all over here and we can say, that can be a number, and it'll be whatever number it needs to be so that this thing integrates to one. And we could stop out of our cleanup here and be like, ah, we did a nice job of cleanup. But does anybody see the way we can clean this up a little bit better? Oh yeah. We have x to the power of n multiplied by x to the power of a minus one. You can combine those terms. You can also combine the term that has one minus x as its base. And if you combine those terms, you're left with x to the power of n plus a minus one and one minus x to the power of m plus b minus one. And at this point, you might feel super good. You're like, so clean, legit. And then the tears start welling. Because you see it. You're like, this isn't as simple as it. It gets simpler. It gets more beautiful. Because if you were to stare at this for long enough, you might be like, wait a second. That's really similar to the beta probability density function. And then at some point, you're like, wait a second. That is a beta probability density function just with different parameters. And then the tears, just happiness streaming from your face as you realize if your prior was a beta and then you observe n heads and m tails, your belief after the information is another beta. So <laughs> anyways, there is a fancy term for this. We call it a conjugate prior. It's like your belief in your random variable takes a part particular form, in this case a beta, before, you get some evidence, and then afterwards you get to use the same equation format. If your belief before you see evidence is a beta, your belief afterwards will also be a beta, and that makes programming much easier. Because, you know, if you're getting new information, you don't have to write new equations, you just have to update parameters. So this is saying, you had a prior belief in A and B, I saw a real number of heads and a real number of tails, and afterwards, I can just update my parameters. That's all I need to do. Because we've done this math once, you can be left with the idea that if your prior was a beta, your posterior, your belief after seeing evidence, is also a beta, where you just add in the number of observed heads and the number of observed tails. Whew. I talk fast, so like I just said a big thing. Maybe I should just like let that sit. Like, whoa, cool. <sighs> Okay, uh, what does this really mean? If you didn't want to derive mathematics, you'd say that you can set your belief uh, as a prior using a beta. So before you do your experiment, you can say, I'm gonna say, I think that this isn't uniform before you start flipping. I'd say it's more likely to be heads. I have a way of expressing that. And then if you did that, you said, I'm going to imagine A fake heads and B fake tails before you start flipping. If you then see n, or sorry, a minus one fake heads, b minus one fake tails. See, I even forgot the minus one plus one. If you then flip this and you see n heads and m tails, your posterior is just a beta as well. Beautiful thing. There is one thing you need to know. Most people don't always use uniform as a prior belief. You know it's a different prior belief that a fellow called Laplace made very popular. He said, my prior belief is one imagined head 
and one imagined tail. And there's a deep uh, philosophy that he went into. He's talking about the probability of the sun rising. And he says, even though I've seen the sun rise every single day and I believe it will likely happen tomorrow, I want to imagine at least one failure and one success so I can hold in my mind some belief that it might not happen in the future. Long story short, having a beta 2.2 is a popular choice for prior. Uniform is popular, beta 2.2 is popular. Okay, funny name, simple prior. Okay, then one last thing before we start playing games. I wanna just show you a cool derivation. What if you asked, what happens if A is one and B is one? Remember A is your number of heads plus one and B is your number of tails plus one? So if you take one and you subtract off one, what are you left with? So this is saying beta with zero heads and zero tails. Oh, <laughs> so you write out your probability density function, you put in your value of number of heads, you get your number of tails, and this is a number to zero, that's one, and this is a number to zero, that's also one, and so you end up with this one times one divided by whatever constant makes this integrate to one, and you're left with one. You know what a beta with a equals one, b equals one is? It's uniform. And that makes sense. If you've seen zero heads and zero tails, your belief is uniform. It's just the prior because you saw no information. Anyways, that's not that deep, but you know, nice little rounding of the corner. Okay, we are going to flip some plates. Okay, I'm going to now show you guys the nice part of the course reader where you can look at a beta. So I'm gonna start flipping this plate. And before I flip this plate, my belief in the probability of a heads is that it's uniform. Beta 1-1, one, one. I've seen zero heads, I've seen zero tails. Are you guys ready for me to flip a plate? Okay, close your ears. Tails. Okay, A is number of heads plus one, I've now seen a tails. Look at that belief. Is it possible to be one probability of a heads? No, because we just saw a tails. But it's this beautiful straight line. Is there a problem? Because this y-axis is two, like it goes all the way up to two, not a problem. Probably densities are allowed to be outside one. If you integrate under this for any range, you'll get a probability. Flip it again. Close your ears. Ooh, I saw a head. So now I've seen one head and one tail. And this is my new belief. It can't be zero probability, it can't be one. It's much more likely to be 50-50 than anything else, but I have a belief. Now, I'm gonna flip it one more time, but then I'm gonna think about how we could update this. I saw myself in other heads. Two ways you could update this. You could say, I've seen two heads and one tails and make my beta. Or you could say, this was my prior belief and I've just observed one heads and zero tails, and because of this conjugate prior thing, they lead to the exact same result. It is still the case that I've seen three heads and one tails. And look at that beta change, I love it. Do you wanna just like come up here and flip a couple? Wonderful head TA, yeah, flip, and then I'll update it. Yay, it does so much for us. We really appreciate you and all the head TA team. Okay, flip, let's go. Oh, another heads. I, in fact, think that this thing does have higher probability of heads. That's why I chose three. I was trying to set you up. Okay. Ooh, another one. Yeah, yeah let's keep flipping. One more, let's do one more for good, for good nature. Ooh, it tails. Okay, so in total, how many times do we flip it? We flipped it four, five, six times. We saw four heads, we saw two tails. Unfortunately, we have to add one to each of those to get the beta parameters, and then you get this probability distribution. We have a belief, it's beautiful. You can ask expectation question, you can talk about variance, you can ask what's the probability that the true probability is between 0.5 and 0.9 by integrating, you can ask all these questions just like with any other random variable. You guys are wonderful, fall on the plot. And that's just all I have to say. <laughs> ah. Okay, so I also just wanted to show you a word problem that I think is interesting. Before being tested, a pill is believed to work about 80% of the time. Then we do a real trial on 20 people. 
In this real trial, it works for 14 people and it doesn't work for six. What is your no belief that the drug works? This is a problem that you could approach in a few ways. Before today in CS109, this is all you could do. You could say, I don't know how to incorporate that 80%, but I do know how to talk about 14 out of 20 patients being successful with the drug, and that gives me a point estimate for probability. But now you can come up with a beta. The only thing is, it doesn't give you a prior in a format we've talked about. The prior is just saying 80%. And can I give you three different priors that match that claim? Here is one prior that matches 80%. I imagine 100 trials, 80 of which were successful. Here's a different prior. I imagine 10 trials of which eight are successful. And here's a different prior. I imagine uh, six trials, sorry, five trials of which four are successful. All of these are ways of representing 80%. But what's the difference? This is very confident, this is medium confidence, and this is minimal confidence. And you'd have to make a choice. You'd have to say, do they mean 80%? and I really should trust them, or do they mean 80% and I want to trust them just a little bit? And the less you trust them, the more the data will dominate your, your belief. And sorry, the higher these parameters, the less the data will dominate, and the lower these parameters, the more the actual observed data will dominate. So in this question, 80% needs to be translated into a prior, three good choices. Actually, there's no wrong answer. Who wants this one? Who wants this one? And who wants this one? They're all right answers. I tend to like priors that are a little bit less assuming. I like to have my data speak for itself as much as possible, but it really depends how much I trust these people. Whoever tells me 80%, like if it's Will, I'm going with the first prior, like whatever you say, I'm going with it. But you know, if it's somebody who I don't know really well, that's the prior I'm going with. <laughs> you can see why there's a division. Some people in probability theory are like, what, you can't be so subjective. Anyways, so if you chose your prior, we now have a way of representing an 80% belief, then what's your posterior? You don't have to go all the way to Bayes' theorem. You could, and if you did go all the way to Bayes' theorem, you would end up deriving this. You'd end up deriving that your posterior was your prior parameter plus number of observed heads, and your prior parameter for number of tails plus observed tails, and you would just add those in. And an interesting thing, if you plot out this prior, and you plot out your posterior, they both tell similar stories, but you've become more confident as you saw more information. You could also talk about the expected value. You could say, hey, this is a whole random variable, but maybe I just want to give one number for probability, and you can do that. You can say, what's the expectation of this random variable? And you could say 0.7. Now, I want to point out a really weird thing about the beta. Expectation is a way of taking a beautiful random variable and collapsing it into one value. It makes me sad because you've lost so much information. There's a different way of taking a whole beautiful random variable and collapsing it into one number called the mode. And they're different things. Expectation is like your weighted average. The mode is whichever value has the highest probability. Whoa, those are two different things. So the mode is the highest point, whichever x value has the highest point in the PDF, and the expectation is just your weighted average of your PDF. Often they were the same. In almost all cases we've seen before, they've been the same. But in this case, they're actually different. The mode is actually number of heads divided by number of heads plus tails. And uh, so if you did your mode and your mean, they're slightly different. But if there is one thing you took away from this, is that single numbers are boring ways of representing probabilities and distributions are so much richer. They capture so much more than single numbers. Questions, comments, concerns. Does the universe change? No, but your understanding of it does? Okay. So, next question for you guys. Which video are you more likely to like? So now that you know about betas, we can think about these as coin flips. This is a coin that's been flipped 10,050 times, and this is a coin that's been flipped 10 times. We could just think about the probabilities as frequentists, or we can think about the probabilities with beta distributions. And if you thought about the probabilities with beta distributions, in this case I'm using that fancy Laplace prior, so I imagine one heads and I imagine one tails. 
This one, look at this beta distribution. What's happened? It's just like a straight line. If you see enough evidence, eventually the beta distribution just looks like a straight line at the true probability. So this one, we know it's like a 99.9 .9 video. But this one, we haven't seen that much information. So we have to hold out the belief it's a 0.6 video or the belief that is a 0.8 video. And so there's a whole distribution. There's a representation of uncertainty. Now, if you want to choose a video, that's a cool algorithm. Wouldn't you like to know an algorithm for choosing this video now? At the moment, what have I told you? I have a way of told you how you can represent your knowledge in a more beautiful way. But I haven't told you how to compare this beta with that beta. Now, what if you guys had to invent that? What if you had to invent a way to decide if this video is better than that one? You can say, what's the probability that I'll like this? That, uh, what's, which video has a greater probability uh, that I like it? Wait. For each video, I can calculate what's the, how likely is it that my probability of liking is greater than 0.9? So I could say, this one, you know, it's 100% that I'll, my chance of liking is point, greater than 0.9. And here I can say, it's not 100% that my chance of liking is greater than 0.9. It's just whatever's under this curve. Okay, I have one last beautiful thing for you guys. I'm done with the beta. I'm not done with the beta. I'm done setting the foundation of the beta. I'm start, ready to start playing. I'm ready to now use the beta to do cool things. But before I do that, if you guys have any other beta questions, shall we? Can I ask a question? Please, yeah, 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 that's all I do. Do you remember my experiment on like, uh, the belief that the child has not been born today? Um, can that to uh, the beta to solve that, like say you had a belief of 18 days, um, and then by day nine the child has not been born. And I was just thinking uh, in the context of what we have today. You're really on to something. Can I hold my very last slide is talking about this connection, but you're on to something, which is in that world, we were thinking about a random variable as this underlying belief, which could take on many values, and the beta is going to start making us do that in lots of cases. So yes, you're, that is the same mindset in both those problems. Could we have multiple betas in such a way that places a heavier emphasis on the more recent ones, I guess? Um, Whoa, like a recency bias? Yeah. You just invented a new random variable. Congratulations. You can name it after me. No, I'm just joking. You can name it after yourself. You actually can't name it after yourself. Someone else has to name it after you. I'll name it after you. No, I'm just joking. Um, uh, that's a really nice idea. And why would you want to do that, though? Is that because you assume that the probability might be changing? Potentially. That's, there's some situations where that's the case. Hey, flipping this plate, the probability is not going to change. There's no reason that one old experiment is less valuable than a new experiment. But other things could change, like the probability of a hurricane. That might be a moving distribution. And what I would encourage you to do if you want to go down the path of inventing this random variable is just try formalizing how you think, like this particular problem you're solving. My probability is changing. Can I make an assumption about how it's changing? And that will lead to a different sort of random variable over your belief in probability. In fact, you'll probably have a model. Okay. Fantastic. You guys are asking good questions. Have you guys heard about AlphaGo? They were the algorithm when humans really for the first time, um, well, won at this board game called Go. And if you don't know this board game called Go, it's this huge board game. It's thought to be the most complicated board games that humans play, and you really needed intuition to be able to win at this game. Um, and then this group called Deep9, which is one of the big AI labs, not too long ago, came up with an algorithm that could win at the world's most complicated board game. An interesting thing that they did is they, they did mix deep learning, but they also mixed deep learning with core reasoning about probabilities and really the sort of beta distribution idea that we've been talking about now. There's this whole world called multi-arm bandits, and it's a really fancy name for something that's kind of simple to describe. A multi-arm bandit, I think, is best described using this scenario. You have two different drugs, drug A and drug B, and you need to be administering them to patients, and you don't know how well they both work. And as you're administrating, you're doing two things simultaneously. You're giving drugs and you're learning about the drugs. 
And that's what a multi-arm bandit is. This is arm one, this is arm two. The bandit makes it sound ridiculous. Um, you could have more than two drugs, like maybe there's six drugs you're choosing between. And every time a patient comes, you have to choose one. And you're both doing it to explore which one's the best and to take advantage of what you've already learned so far. Isn't that an interesting problem? Do you guys wanna play? Okay, I need another volunteer to come up and play. Uh, you're going to, or actually, you know what? You're all going to play. I'm going to pull up this game, and the way this game works is there's two drugs, and we have to make decisions. And just to add the stakes, I'm going to assume that these drugs are for, uh, let's just say they're for Pokemon so we don't have to think about anything grim. And your Pokemon are going to live or die. <laughs> well, let me just open a new terminal so it's cleaner. Python. So. Can you guys see this okay? In the back? There's two drugs, your first patient walks in, A or B. You're like, what? I don't know, what's the problem of A and B? That's the beauty of this. You don't know, you have to make a choice. You're like, this is an awful, awful game already. Okay, who wants A, who wants B, just yell. A. I heard a lot of Bs. We did it! <laughs> Yay, fantastic, our Pokemon lives. And then another person comes, A or B. A. <laughs> Why do you want A? It's obviously B worked. A is a better grade. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you want A? Why do you have made that sense? Just curious. Yeah. <laughs> Just curious. No, curious is right. Um, you know, there's a possibility we should be learning about our drugs as well. I'm doing B. <laughs> oh, I immediately regret it. Okay, your curiosity was good, but it was possible that A was perfect. But now I've tried B twice. It worked once and it failed again. Who wants A and who wants B now? Just yell. A. Everyone wants A and the intuition is, yeah, I have more information about B, but I haven't explored A at all. It might be way better. And I play A, yes! And now who wants A or B? A. Fantastic, oh. A or B? B. A. 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 B, B, B. Oh my God, I'm out of control. I'm just making decisions without any sort of reasoning. Do a bunch of A's in a row. Yeah, you could do a bunch of A's in a row. You can do a bunch of B's in a row. And then you can go back and like try and estimate and make better decisions from here on out. There's so many contexts where this game is important. And it's not just about drugs. There's lots of things like um, if you're trying to learn how to make decisions under uncertainty, even if it's something small, like you're trying to give somebody a nudge on Duolingo and you're trying to decide if you give a nudge or not, it's this game. This game exists in so many, sorry, a nudge is like, hey, have you studied Spanish lately? You know, they do that. They have this whole paper where they use this algorithm. I'm just about to teach you. So this game, we just played it. Is there a principled way of playing this game? And people have done a lot of research on this, and it's still out for debate. There's different people who have different ideas on how you could play this. I'm going to set up a particular context. You've tried B five times. You've tried, um, oh, sorry. If you've tried B five times, and you got two successes and three failures, we have a formal way of thinking about the probability that B is successful. Uh, and you can talk about expectations, we can talk about the probability that the true probability is greater than some number. And actually, I just want to talk about this one for a second, just to get us warmed up to this problem. If X is a beta, because I've seen, I tried uh, drug B five times, I got two successes, um, and I got three failures, I can set up the beta, you're like, why three and four? Oh right, I have to add one to success and failures. What happens if I ask you, what's the probability that the true P is greater than 0.6? Well, then that's asking the probability that my random variable is greater than 0.6, which we know is one minus the probability that the random variable is less than 0.6, which means you can do one minus the CDF of the beta. And then you're just like, oh, hey, I don't remember what the CDF of the beta is. You go over to your favorite course reader and you're like, there's the PDF and there's a, C hey! Ba ba ba. If you look at our other continuous random variables, they often have this thing called a CDF that's probably the random variable is less than a value, and the beta doesn't have a closed form. A little bit like the normal distribution. Is the game over? No, the game's not over. We just have numerical approximators. So 
you know, if I need the beta CDF, I don't use an equation, I go to Python. And Python has a numerical way of telling me the CDF of a beta. So anyways, you could do one minus, you know, stats.beta.cdf, you put in 0.6 for x and you put in your two parameters and you'll get a number back. Okay, few. So even though there's no closed form for the CDF, I do want to point out that we just use Python, which uses a numerical approximator. Okay. Which leaves us with this game. We call it, I mean, it's got this awful name. It's called the exploration exploitation trade-off. That's, that's this multi-arm bandit where you're trying to choose between A and B. And, and philosophically, you're choosing between going to the place that you've been to the most and you know have the most information or going and learning more about one of your different arms or drugs, if you're using that metaphor. There's, as I said, this is not a closed problem. There's still different people debating on how you could solve this drug problem. One algorithm is this thing called upper confidence bounds, which is for each drug, you keep a probability distribution over its success. And then you think about like an upper bound of confidence. You set some threshold of maybe like a standard deviation or two standard deviations, and you try and choose uh, drugs that have the higher upper confidence. That's one way of doing it. But then somebody not too long ago wrote a paper that pulled on some math from a little while ago and said, wait a second, there's this other algorithm that works insanely well for choosing drug A or drug B. Here's how it goes. You've been playing the game for a while where you can have drug A and you can have drug B. Why do my A and Bs look like graphs? Because we're using betas. You know, I did number of successes, number of failures. I got the beta CDF and if you plot them, you get these two things. So it's like drug B we've tried more Drug A looks a little bit better, but we haven't tried it as much. So that's the state of the game. How do you choose which drug to play next? And somebody not too long ago came up with this wicked simple idea. Take drug A's PDF and sample from it. You're more likely to get a number in the high density regions and less likely to get a number in the low density regions. So let's do this. Let's say you randomly sample and you get this value. And that's going to be my A sample. For B, you sample from B. And you may just happen to choose a sample over here. It's not that likely, but when you sample, you can get any value. It's just more likely to get them in the high probability regions. You know, if you do a Gaussian sample, you're more likely to get something near the mean. If you do a sample from this beta, you're more likely to get something in the high probability regions. So step one is choose a sample from each drug's beta. So here I got A. And that was like equal to 5.58. That's my sample for drug A. And my sample for drug B was equal to 0.42. Here's the crazy thing. We're halfway through an algorithm. The next step in the algorithm, you know which drug we choose? Not the one that has a higher area under the curve at any point, just which everyone had the higher sample. And they would say, you choose drug A here. When you're making a choice, you take your betas, you sample from them, and you select the drug with the higher sample. And the argument was, this does two different things. It balances the fact that if you're really confident drug is good, you'll always sample from that high probability. And if you're really confident it's better, you'll just always make the right choice. But when you're unconfident, it does a beautiful balance of exploring and taking advantage of which one it already thinks is better. People are arguing that this is, in some context, the best algorithm. But there could be better ones. You could invent one. In fact, there's a 109 student last quarter I taught this who said, if you always choose a drug such that if the probability of drug A beta is greater than the probability of B, I choose A. And if the probability of B is greater than A, I choose B. And they, they figure out this inequality and then that's how they made their choice. They claim to me that this is better than Thompson sampling. I was like, ooh, that's kind of cool. Um, and maybe they're right. What I will tell you is you guys get to play. So if you look at problem set four, the last problem on problem set four is to play exactly this game. You're going to write a function. You'll get a history of all 
the drugs that have been given and whether or not they worked, and then you have to return either A or B. And when you run one game, here I'm always choosing A, and you'll get a score of how well you did. If you run test agent, you'll get a score over multiple trials. I want you guys to implement this Thompson sampling, which will be pretty easy now that you know what a beta is, but feel free to try and come up with a better algorithm if you feel so fit. Okay, so can I summarize today? You learned about betas, a beautiful way of representing probabilities. And then we used it for a new randomized algorithm. It's the distribution for probabilities. It's got this beautiful formula. It's actually the very last distribution I, I plan to talk about. And so you can imagine it is a new distribution to add to our whole pile of distributions we have so far. If there's one philosophy that I really want to drive home, it's that in life, we often convolve things into a single number. But it's so much more elegant if you can keep a whole random variable, which has a whole belief distribution, because then you're able to represent your uncertainty. And if you can represent your uncertainty, you can do things like Thompson sampling. You can make better decisions under uncertainty if you can represent what you don't know. I feel like this doesn't represent what it doesn't know, but the beta really does. We talked about this at the beginning of class, and that confidence in a probability is something we've now gained with the ability to articulate betas. So if somebody says like, my leg itches when it rains, and they're probably 0.8, that's close to a uniform. You know, like that sounds like a pretty useless uh, probability. But this one, we can have a formal way of talking about the beta distribution that it comes from. And we can say that that second one is more confident and we have language for that. And then I wanna leave you with this other idea. We talked about using probability as a random variable. A probability you can think of as the parameter to a binomial. It's like the parameter to this binomial, what was the thing that was unknown that we allowed to be a random variable. And you can do this for any parameter. For example, a Poisson, you could say, I don't know the true rate, and I would like to estimate the true rate. And you can say, what's the belief distribution in the true rate given that observed some history? And maybe that's the more interesting thing. And you can talk about, if you're like taking an eye disease like we did in section a while ago, and you see some count of cells, instead of just saying, I think this is Poisson, you can allow for, it's a Poisson, and I've only seen five cells. I don't know what the true average is. And by having a softer belief, if somebody asks you, did this person get better or worse? You can make a better decision about that. And so my bigger point is, you could take any parameter and allow it to be a random variable. And that will be a more elegant way of expressing it. And that was related, I think, to the question about baby births before, which is that really taking all these concepts and making them random variables will give you much more powerful ways to talk about likelihoods. Thank you guys so much. If you're taking an exam tonight, good luck. If you're not taking an exam tonight, definitely don't talk to anyone about the exam you took. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Come back on Friday. We'll continue this great topic in CS19. I'm rooting for all of you guys. I'm thinking about you often. Have a wonderful day.